So let me just briefly introduce to you our speaker. So first would be um, Professor Roland Fletcher. Now he is actually a professor of theoretical, uh, theoretical and world archaeology at the University of Sydney. He attended St. John's College at Cambridge University, completing his PhD in 1975. He has worked at the University of Sydney since 1976, where he has implemented a global and multi-scalar interdisciplinary approach to archaeology. From his theoretical work and to test predictions about the interaction between urban life, massive infrastructure and environmental change, Professor Fletcher has developed the International Greater Angkor Project and is the director of the Angkor Research Programme of the University of Sydney. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Fletcher, please. Thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk, um, apart from the fact that this magnificent location given talk. What I'm going to do today is to bring together two portions of my research, um, both generally on the behavior of human beings and then more specifically on the transformations which have occurred in the last 10,000 years. Broadly, the field I'm concerned with is the last seven million years, though most of it will be the last four million, and then I will describe in somewhat detail the last 10,000 years. Now, the issue of cultural evolution... Sorry. Okay. The issue of cultural evolution uh, is a very vexing one um, because we have no agreed theory of cultural evolution. There has been an ongoing debate since the 19th century. A uh, number of eminent researchers, including Boyd and Richardson, have made proposals about the relationship between biology and culture. And there's been some outstanding research on the processes involved by people like Dunbar and by Steve Shannon. There is, however, no conceptual position which plays the role of the biological theory of evolution. And there is even some debate, and there is quite serious disagreement in anthropology, for example, about whether an evolutionary approach is appropriate at all. I'm going to discuss that in a little bit of detail to give you some idea of what the problem is and then move on to the story of what has happened and where I think there is actually a cultural evolution that is happening. The key premise I'm using is that the logic of the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution is the appropriate conceptual tool to use. But notice logic, not the process of the biological model only the logic of that model, which is the logic of multiscalarity, of disassociation between scales of process, and the critical role of variation. Now, the reason why we run into a problem is that in the 19th century in Europe, specifically in the British Isles, there were two very great thinkers the one we're always familiar with, Charles Darwin, is the person who proposed the biological theory. But concurrent with Darwin, and highly respected by him, was a philosopher, Herbert Spencer, who proposed a cultural model of evolution. It was pointed out by Freeman in the 1970s that the core of the problem of the discussion of this phenomenon in anthropology, history, and philosophy is that many scholars are debating Spencer when they think they're debating Darwin. There is a fundamental confusion in the humanities about what we're actually talking about. And the core problem, of course, is that what the Spencerian model does, unlike the Darwinian model, is that it is progress-focused and it is oriented on types 
and it is strongly preoccupied with the notion of the social rather than behavior. You can see from this graph that in fact Spencer and Darwin were just about as frequently discussed in that period and the issue of evolution became a dominant topic. The problem of course is that the position of stage theory, its progressivism, had two very serious components built into it. One was the tendency to use the notion of the type, which remains very popular in anthropology and even still in archaeology, when in fact the type, as distinct from a range of variation in the population, is the model that is now habitually used in biology. We have a lot of talk about variation in culture, but in fact very little statistical or metrical analysis of the role of variation. It's noted and then largely bypassed. And the reason for that is that theories of evolution in culture tend, from Spencer's great propositions, to be mentalist. They're concerned with thinking and reasoning and propositions, sources of innovation, and so on. What this tends to do is to analogize from operations in the mind, in the brain, to operations in the genetic system. And it restricts, most specifically, any attention to materiality, all this stuff that's around us. Because what that approach tends to do is to argue that sociality is what is important and materiality is just an epiphenomenon. Materiality is just a sort of stuff that happens to be thrown off by the sociality. And my argument is that it is not. And that it is actually in the materiality that cultural evolution is occurring. One of the interesting debates is whether it is occurring at all in the other components of culture. And that's going to be one of the issues that we can discuss. The problem with the type concept brought into archaeology is that it borrowed the concept of the type fossil from paleontology, with the type fossil being an index of something, an index of a period. And that was taken into anthropology and archaeology in the 19th and the early 20th century, that artifacts were indicators of something. So the classic, for instance, is that writing is an indicator of civilization. So the material is merely an index of something else that is more important. And what it tends to do is to see the dynamic in the sociality rather than the dynamic in the relationship between the sociality and the material. So instead of this convention, what I will be arguing is that cultural process actually looks like this. The material is running on its own agenda, a version of the argument that's being made, for instance, by Brian Arthur about the dynamics and the internal structure of technology change. What I want to illustrate straight away is that when we get on to the evolution of the hominins, which I'm not going to discuss in great detail, what you can see is that when you plot the major transformations in culture, the appearance of tools, appearance of fire, color coding, they occur in the middle of the developments of particular species and genera. They are not the markers of the beginning of that creature. There's therefore a dynamic interaction where a biological change in the behavior of a particular species or genus leads to a transformation in materiality, which is part of the critical process that generates the next transformation in the physiology of the creature. Running through to the last 50,000 years where the game changes. 
Now, just briefly, um, I will be using the term hominin. Um, many of you may be more familiar with the notion of calling us hominids. The term hominid now includes the great apes. The hominins are us and our immediate ancestors from the chimpanzees onwards. So that's the use of that term. The proposition I want to introduce is that rather than thinking of the material as an epiphenomenon, we need to think of the material as a behavior in its own right, whose evolution can be analyzed. And when you do this, an interesting effect occurs. When we talk about the evolution of humans, we have commonly tended to think in terms of tools. And one of the reasons for that is a focus on purposive behavior. But when you actually list the cultural behavior of the great apes, the basal behavior which is actually common to us as hominins and to all the great apes is actually nesting and camping behavior. A notable example of this, which should define the ancestry of cultural behavior, is the gorillas. The gorillas habitually make campsites of multiple human animals who define spaces on the ground. The important thing about the spaces they define on the ground is that they commonly make vegetation rings or patches. What is important to note is that they're not necessarily making a comfortable bed. They quite frequently make a ring of vegetation and they sleep on the ground inside it. This is actually space defining. This is spatial behavior. It's the spatial organizing of the group. So on the left here, you see four examples of camps of gorillas that uh, Shala recorded. And if you plot the distances between them, what you can see is that there is a very distinct, consistent spatial pattern. Particular distances dominate, and there are rare occurrences of other distances. This is a very powerful, highly consistent signal. These are all interrelated local groups of gorillas. The point about this, and it's something that we so completely take for granted in our behavior that we don't notice it very much, except on very crowded trains, is that our spatial behavior is highly ordered. This is Bondi Beach from the air. This is a phenomenon you can see anywhere you watch human beings. Um, it's not very easy for you to do in these seats, but I could ask you to do something very embarrassing and actually move sideways until you're completely touching the people next to you. You will find this somewhat uncomfortable. And the reason you will find it uncomfortable is that our lives are actually dominated by nonverbal meaning, not by verbal meaning. Our behavior is dominated by our gesture patterns, and by our spatial behavior, our kinesics and our proxemics. And that is the fundamental phenomenon of behavior which we have in common with the great apes. If you look then at human spatiality, patterns of buildings, you get this similar arrangement of highly patterned spatial behavior. The key thing to notice is that this is nothing to do with raw material. There's a very famous example in the southwest of the United States of a Spanish mission built within a Hopi Pueblo. And the Spanish so annoyed the Hopi that one day they all got up and they murdered all the Spaniards. And then they took over the mission and converted it into a Pueblo. That's what Spanish space looks like. That's what Hopi space looks like. They're completely different. They use different sizes of room space. They use different components of timber. There is no determinism. It is the spatial behavior of the group that defines the form. So the key point here is that the basal platform from which our behavior has evolved is actually the camp. 
and we should look for the origin of tool behavior in hominins, camping, and pushing material around out on the open savanna in order to define their spatiality. It is from that context of behavior that we then get recognizable tools. The earliest we have at the moment are somewhere between 3.5 and about 3 million years ago. And very interestingly, the ones on the right, which are hominin, are quite similar to the ones on the left, which are chimpanzee. Interestingly, the brain sizes are quite similar, but there is a fundamental and striking difference in these behaviors. The chimpanzees use stone tools only in one place. They stay in one place with those tools, usually hammer stones on a hammer rock. The difference with hominins is that hominins picked up and moved stone and moved it around the landscape and moved it with themselves and wherever they stopped, they made stone tools. This is crucial because it leads to a very serious behavioral condition for the hominin population. What we see is the distribution of early stone tools, predominantly early in Africa, next earliest in Europe, and then in Asia. The key thing about this behavior is what it does on the ground. Not what the tools are used for, not what the hominins intended, but what they actually created. This, for instance, is the site of Ubedia in Israel, where I worked in the 1960s. This is actually a living floor, and it's a remarkable site to work on because what has happened is that tectonic uplift has taken a horizontal surface and tipped it up. So you're actually looking at what was formerly a horizontal surface. This is what hominins do. No great ape does anything like this. What hominins do by manipulating stone is they create highly visible patches on the surface. And the whole point of that being a value to archaeologists, of course, it never goes away. That's why we can find the sites, even now. But what that means is that what early stone tool use introduced into the human landscape was a permanent cultural landscape. If you went into a valley as a hominin who was not familiar with an area, you could know that there were other hominins there because of the patches of stone. And you could also know from reasonable observation that whoever had made those campsites was not you and was not related to you. The significance of the material is that once it's introduced into our behavior, it becomes a new variable in its own right that affects what we do. There's another element in which stone is deadly serious. Uh, this is Lucy. Uh, Lucy's a relative of mine. She's also a relative of all of yours as well. She's an Australopithecine. Uh, this is a wonderful life-size model of her at the top of the staircase of evolution in Aarhus Museum. It's a very nice museum because she's at the top and Homo sapiens is at the bottom of the staircase. This is just to show you her size. Now, why is this significant? Because there's another element of what stone tools do. And you should all be deeply grateful for this. That on the left is sort of me. That's a male Australopithecus afarensis. And that is the hyenas on the same scale that were on the landscape. Now, this Australopithecine has nails like us, useless, and stupid little small teeth. But if you look very carefully at the hand, there's this gray object. If you're a hyena and you thought you were going to get a cheap dinner, 
you are not going to get from a homonym. Guess who's in the zoo? <laughs> not us. What happened very rapidly in cultural terms from that point on was enormous transformation in the form of stone tools. This is the Shirleyan assemblage from about a million years ago, a million and a half. And it has a very striking characteristic. The big selective pressure on stone tools was shape differentiation and elaboration. Indeed, in the Acheulean assemblages, one of the most startling phenomena is gigantoliths, which are those things at the bottom. These are Acheulean hand axes this big. They're no use. They're no use for anything except they would be super visible. What we appear to be seeing is that a very powerful selective operator in the nature of stone tools is for them to become more differentiated and more visible. A colleague of mine, Peter White, working in New Guinea many years ago, demonstrated that the most efficient way to make a stone tool is to put a piece of rock there take another piece of rock and go smash and pick up the pieces that are useful. This is a waste of time. This is not necessary to make a useful tool. This is part of a selection in the relationship between humans and tools that is elaborating their signal role independent of whatever other function they have. And they created, this is the great site of Olegoseli in Kenya, this type of landscape. You can see that today. That has been there for nearly a million years. That became a permanent component of the existence of our ancestors. And part of the way they operated in their world. They knew who was where and they knew whether they were in familiar territory or unfamiliar territory, which in terms of the behavior of an animal is profoundly important and does not occur with the great apes. Their signatures, which are primarily organic, disappear from the landscape very rapidly. This is the distribution of the Acheulean, again, primarily in origin in Africa. I'll use these maps later on to show you what has happened to the rate of change in culture. Then from about 1.5 million years ago, we started doing interesting things with fire. Our view of this has somewhat changed because a recent study of chimpanzees in the wild has actually found that chimpanzees are not particularly afraid of fire. We have tended to assume that all animals other than us would be afraid of fire. Chimps don't seem to be. They know how to avoid it. They know how to move around it. And there is a very good reason for a competent hominid to not be afraid of fire. Because if you follow behind a bushfire, you get lots of cooked food. And you get cooked food for absolutely nothing. And cooked food is high yield return. So any competent bipedal or quadrupedal calculating hominid would be likely to engage with fire. Getting an ancestry for fire in the use behavior of human beings is not too complicated. The story is rather strange, however. <clears throat> we can see again that this is a behavior with an African ancestry. When you look down in sites like Wonderwork in southern Africa, there are actually layers of ash in the caves. There appears to be some kind of generalized engagement with fire, which has been mapped in great detail by people like John Gowlett. What you see is a very important phenomenon, a very long period of all sorts of different ways of engaging with fire, a high range of variability, out of which somewhere around half a million years ago, you start to get the focus on the recognizable hearth. But the significance of fire is not just 
food return, security, and so on. What is significant about fire is you light a fire and you tell other hominins where you are. Captain Cook, for instance, when he was sailing down the east coast of Australia, knew that Australia was inhabited before he was anywhere near the coast because he could see the columns of smoke from people's fireplaces. What fire introduces into a landscape is the capacity to observe a cultural landscape over huge distances. And the critical thing about that is that, again, that services avoidance and attraction behavior in the animal. It would powerfully, preferentially select for those hominids with the brain analysis capacity to deal with that geometry. This is probably the profound transformation in the behavior of human beings, because it allows hominins to interact at distance without meeting each other. They can avoid or they can seek to engage. What then follows with increasing rapidity is a series of changes which we recognize as very distinctly human. We start to play around with color about 30, 300,000 years ago. We start using colors like hematite for red. There's white being used elsewhere. There are proposals about black as well, but that's a bit unclear. The key point again about color is that if you colorize yourself, you deliver a social message at distance. I don't have to come anywhere near you. I can see if you're painted white or you've got yellow on your forehead or whatever. It is delivering a message about what you are without me having to approach you, make a noise to you, or smell you. It's an extremely powerful additional signal. And when you look in the archaeological record, and you look at the work that Dunbar has been doing, one of the very striking conditions is that when you start to get the use of ochre, you start to get the skyrocketing change in the size of communities calculated from the size of brain structure. We then start doing some really weird things. Probably the weirdest of all, though we think it's quite normal, is disposal of the dead, particularly burial. We've become so used to the idea that burial is something that we should normally do that we have retrodicted our ideas into the past. This, of course, defeats the whole logic of evolution, which is that this is a behavior which must have evolved. The key thing to notice is that if you have a close relative who has died, it is very peculiar behavior, in fact, really peculiar behavior, to dig a hole, put them in it, and drop dirt on their face. This is very weird behavior. This is something that we don't properly understand. This is hominins beginning to understand something about the relationship between time and life. A chimpanzee female will usually engage with its dead chimp baby for maybe four days you have to have longer cognition in order to organize burial. And one of the really intriguing things you see, once again, when you consider this in variation terms, is that when you actually look at the archaeological record, for nearly a million years, hominins were fooling around with dead bodies. There is an enormous frequency of defleshing of bodies in the archaeological record and we've no idea what they're up to. Are they eating them? Are they just defleshing them because it's a strange thing you do? Are they piles of meat in the space? We don't know. This is very unusual behavior. And then somewhere around 
70,000 years ago, we begin that distinctive behavior of representation. This is again earliest in Africa, but it expands at phenomenal speed. It's at 70,000 in Africa. It's certainly there at 40,000 in Europe, slightly later in Asia. These are expansions which took a million years previously. The critical thing with representation is that what representation does is it stores information outside the human brain. Writing, for instance, is just a special case. I always like to annoy my students uh, by pointing out that the reason why they're taking notes in my lectures is so they can forget what I've said. That's the real value of storing information outside your brain. You don't have to store the stack. All you have to know is where to go and get the information. And the really striking thing you see in early art is geometric configurations and what are periodicity configurations. Successions of marks next to each other, then another set of marks and another set of marks. These were studied many years ago and the results are intriguing. When we see the distribution of art, what we're familiar with is this. This is the great glory of Upper Paleolithic art in Europe, the bulls of the cave of Altamira in Spain. But there is actually a whole extended assemblage of mobiliary art, small items, which has intriguing characteristics. The first is that you have images of females, predominantly females, not entirely, predominantly females. But you have all sorts of pieces of bone with complex marks on like this. The achievement of Alexander Marshak was to look at these marks and take photomicrographs showing which tool was used to make which marks. This is not random, this is not done all at one time. This is an additional set of information. What you are seeing is a process whereby you can start recording periodicities, times between seasons, reproductive sequences, reproductive sequences of animals, all sorts of other things. The key point is not what it was specifically used for, but that what is happening here is that storage is able to occur outside the brain. And that, as you can see from the ratio between a baby's head and the pelvis, is a pretty good idea. Um, what you can see is if you're a chimpanzee, birth is something that you as a modern human female could seriously envy. In modern humans, we have very little clearance. And the critical process that occurred is that we have got to a situation where the pelvis and the brain are, are about stuck. The effect of the material transformation of creating art, doesn't matter why it was created, is that the effect is to take selective pressure off the biological expansion of the brain. And very interestingly, from this point on, after those transformations, 100,000 years with time and burial, 70,000 years with the organization of information, we are at the end of the biological evolutionary process for the development of modern humans. The Neanderthals hang on for a while, but it is we who dominate the world. What has happened in our behavior is not just that cultural processes are going faster now, they have been going faster and faster for several million years. It's easy to see on a log-log scale. Uh, that bottom dot on the right is an interesting problem. It's to do with the distribution of burial, and it may actually relate to Neanderthal behavior 
and not to modern human behavior. So the situation we've got into is that by about 50,000 years ago, and probably also associated, though it's a big debate, with the issue about the full-scale use of language in its current form, we have moved to a different form of evolution and selection. One of the reasons you can see is that if you look at modern human behavior between 35,000 and 10,000 years ago, it's ours. It's astonishingly sophisticated, and it involves the use of very substantial, long-remembered sequences of necessary actions. To give you an example, this is the famous burial from Sungir. This man, buried 25,000 years ago, was wearing equipment for being in the cold, clothing for being in the cold, that would rival a current sports store today. This is multiple complex component clothing. And the guy was buried in a grave with that long white thing next to him. That is a mammoth ivory spear. You think, oh, yeah, that's a mammoth ivory spear. That's the problem. Mammoth ivory comes in a curved form that's been heat straight. That is a very fancy piece of technology. Very long ordered information sequences. When you look at the occupation sites, you get elaborate patterns. You see the very precise positioning of the fireplaces down the middle of this occupation site. Even more remarkable, in the site of Metzin, you have small huts. But these huts are made of mammoth bone. And when the mammoth bone was radiocarbon dated, it turned out that this isn't humans running around killing a whole bunch of mammoths, stripping them and then using their bone. Those bones are centuries apart in time. This is humans culling the dumps of mammoth bone that form in the big rivers and selecting from those dumps the pieces that they actually need for the engineering of these structures. You're looking at an animal that has the same analytic capacity, the same capacity for long recorded sequences of actions as we do. And this has led us into an interesting situation. What we tend to forget is that there were very few hominins. We were pretty thin on the ground. What we have done in the last 10,000 years is we've gone from behaving like an oryx in small groups down the bottom to behaving like wildebeest. We have gone from being a small group animal to being a giant herd animal. And the way we have done that and the way we have tended to assume is that we thought this was all to do with sociality. But if you look at it in material terms, it is actually serviced by the material which we use. In order for us to function in groups, we have to manage space, time, sight, and sound. And the way you can do that without social stress is to use the material. Those of you who have teenage children will know the fundamental value of the door on their bedroom. It is much easier to control noise by shutting the door than by telling people to be quiet. What the material does is it relieves the behavioral stresses in a society. If you have multi-room buildings, you can do all sorts of different things and you're not impacting on each other. The argument I've been making uh, since 1995 is that the three great transformations which have occurred over the last 10,000 years to sedentary communities, to initial urbanism, and then the transformation into industrial cities, which we're now living in, is actually made possible by successive changes in cultural assemblages. 
So for example, what started to happen about 10,000 years ago was that we began to be sedentary. It's a little problematic working out what this behavior consists of. It's commonly associated with agriculture. But over time, what it leads to is very rapid expansions of populations because reproduction rates in sedentary hominids are very much higher than in mobile hominids. We can see the transformation in the archaeological record. This is sizes of settlements over time. And what you see after about 10,000 years ago is this steep increase in the absolute size of the settlements. What is being used in this process is phenomena like rectilinearity, which was very rare previously, periodicity marking, durable walling to block out sound, and color coding. These are all behavioral phenomena which were already present in the late Pleistocene hominids and have come into our behavior and have now started transforming the machinery of our societies and the magnitude of our organization. So you can see in a site like Beta, transformations from the mobile system to the sedentary system, which has led to a tremendous diversity of cultural systems on the planet. We can make spaces of amazingly diverse form. The next stage, which occurred somewhere around 5,000 years ago and continued until early in the current era, is the development of agrarian-based urbanism. Very strikingly, agrarian-based urbanism only occurs in six places in the world, whereas the sedentary transitions occurred in 15 or 16. The implication is that this is much more energy demanding, it's much more unpredictable. What happens, and this is the critical point about separating material behavior from sociality, is that the material phenomena necessary for these transformations to occur predates them. It is not the case that sign systems occur in the cities. They occur millennia before the cities. They are preconditions for the formation of the cities, not the type fossil indicator of them. So for example, there's a whole range of characteristics I won't go through in detail. What I want you to notice is that if you look in the history of China, on the right-hand side in black is the period when the big cities began to develop. On the left, back to 7000 BC, is all the various characteristics which were required, the physical characteristics which were required. There is an enormous amount of variation these cultural attributes, which all came together in those cities, are occurring on their own in combination with other things. They appear and they disappear. There's an enormous period of variation from which you get these abrupt transformations. That's the distribution of those prerequisite characteristics in China. In many areas of China, they never went anywhere. Only in two areas did they come together, and the implication is purely at random. There is no particular pattern to why they came together, but where they came together, the takeoff would occur. And that leads you to the spectacular scale of the early Chinese cities. Those are cross-section at the top of the dirt walls of one of these cities. This led to the development of the agrarian urban world, which continued through to the 19th century. You can put a million people into a city of this sort. You're limited by the communication systems you have, word of mouth and sign systems. And then, in the 19th century, we experienced the transformation which we're now in. That is the development of industrial urbanism, which uses a whole suite of information managers like clocks, differential transport, 
mechanized printing, all of which precede the problem that they solved. They all preceded cities hitting their maximum agrarian size in the 19th century by several centuries. They're prerequisites. They're not the markers of the city. They are the thing you had to have for the cities to expand. So for example, the modular architecture which we always associate with the awful housing of the workers is in fact an elite phenomenon of the preceding two centuries. Modular architecture was not invented to house workers. It was developed as part of elite cultural systems in Europe and as part of farming communities in the Americas. The world we then created was this. So what is the context of all this? When you map the sizes and the residential densities of large numbers of communities, that's population size of the settlements on the bottom axis and density on the vertical, this is the pattern that you get. You notice that there is an upper limit. To analyze that, that steeply sloping surface is the upper limit on mobile communities. Mobile communities can reach sizes of 10,000 or so, but at very low densities. The majority of mobile communities are very small and have very high densities. And what is striking is that if you look at this in terms of the evolution of human behavior, we were largely over in that space on the left for most of our existence. We were then down to settlement sizes of about one hectare in extent prior to 10,000 years ago. And with the arrival of sedentism, we have broken out on this band to the right. And that breakout is very serious. It's occurred roughly in three stages, three successive size jumps, which are marked in red there. The significance of this is that we are now, and I'm going to move over to the image for a moment, we are now in this space. We are now here. But all our settlements are dropping this way. There are no modern cities up on this range here. Because if you were up here, you would have populations of 150 million people in one city. We have cities here the size of entire states' population. What is worrying about this is that we appear to have some broad incremental transformation of a multiple of a hundred times in the maximum size of settlements. This depends upon modes of managing information which have become increasingly demanding and increasingly costly. And we're on a worrying trajectory. If you plot the time it has taken for these changes to occur, the initial one, which probably goes back to about 200,000 years, is very slow. And then, the two that we're really familiar with have accelerated, and we are now in a steep takeoff. What is happening is that the rate of growth of settlements goes up by a thousand times when the maximum size goes up a hundred times. You can see this if you look at energy consumption. These are the energy consumption patterns at successive stages in that stepping up of the size of our settlements. And this is where the analysis is of some relevance to the situation we're in. Because somewhere ahead of us is one of these great size transitions. If the pattern of one hectare, one square K, 100 square K as a maximum limit continues, the next limit is 10,000 square K for compact cities. 
We have plenty of low-density cities bigger than that, but not compact ones. So the question is, what is going on or will be going on at that transition? And here you need to be concerned. Because when that next transition occurs, according to this phenomenon and the impact of the material, the takeoff rate for the next urban transformation will be 5 million square kilometers per century of expansion. The Industrial Revolution at 5,000 square K was bad enough. That's what 5 million square K looks like. That's Australia. The immediate reaction is to say, no, couldn't possibly happen. Unfortunately, there were very fine philosophers in Britain who thought exactly that before the Industrial Revolution. Don't kid yourself. Materiality, the stuff that we're producing, is the ancestor for whatever will be required for that transition across that 10,000 square K limit. And when it goes, it will go at that speed. I'm then going to skip right to the end. The point about the situation we're in, and the reason why culture is so versatile, is not simply because we have speech, but because we have three scales of signaling in human culture, unlike the one that is in the gene system. We have speech, sound, that's music and speech. We have action, which is gestures like this, posture, standing, and so on. And we have the material. And the crucial thing about those three is that they differ in their replication rates. The sound replication rates are extremely fast. If I stop speaking, you don't hear anything. I have to keep speaking. I have to do it really fast. If I'm standing, <coughs> I can stand for much longer in one place. You've all been sitting for much too long. And then with the material, the replication rates for material things are even slower. They stick around for a long time. The important point about replication rates is that replication relates to rates of change. And the key implication of this is that the problem we face now is that as a result of that material transformation in the period between 50,000 and 30,000 years ago, we have a triple code system in our behavior, not a monocode which is what works in genetics. We have three code systems replicating at different rates in collision with each other. And the key is that we build massive inertial, for instance, material spaces, and our social system is changing at an incredible pace inside that space. We have to deal with the non-correspondent relationship between the consequences of those three signal systems. There has been an evolution of cultural behavior. In my view, it's been the evolution of the material and its selective impact. If you want to know what material behavior looks like, first of all, look around you. But also, this is what she looks like. This is the little black dress in its variants in one season in 2001. What we've done is taken the outline of every little black dress that was being represented in Marie Claire. That is variation in material behavior. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. He would like to take it. Uh, any questions, if there is any quick questions? Hi. Uh, okay, so China and so well some other countries are developing these super speed trains, yeah. which are you know supposed to be traveling at 4,000 kilometers an hour. Right. Those vacuum tube train. So that might bring about that that final settlement, the super settlement that you might you talk about. Well, this is this is a, a really serious issue because 
The point of this analysis is that the characteristics which will generate those future changes are likely to be somewhere around in our society already. The obvious one is digital computing, which is the descendant of mechanized printing and art and so on. One interesting thing about this is that one of the keys to industrialization was a wide variety of ranges of transportation speed. Because if you have differential transportation speed, you have differential value. So exactly the point you've made begins to be quite ominous. The more we create high-speed systems within our world, we are creating the ordinary speed systems of the next transformation. But that would mean that the minimum size of the cities we would be talking about is 100 to 150 million human beings. So we would be dealing in a transformation as profound as the Industrial Revolution. The big problem is that judging from those accelerating rates of transformation, the next change is relatively soon and relatively fast. Bear in mind I'm an archaeologist, so relatively fast doesn't mean what you think it means. But it's moving pretty quickly. So that's a good example of the kind of concern that we should have. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. Um, I was just wondering whether your measure should be in K squared or K cubed, because right now we are not growing up. We are not growing far, but we are growing up. So in terms of your basis, should it be kilometer cube rather than kilometer square? The, there's a very good answer, which is that I'm an archaeologist and I deal with stuff where there's no up. So what I calculate is the total number of people in a space. Um, the key point is that we're all stacked in the sky, but if we're going to get out of here, we have to go down to the ground floor. We're all moving through that space down there in order to function. Um, but there is a very reasonable comment arising about the implications of future settlement systems where you work on a multi-stack system, because that would change the agenda profoundly. That's, it's a very, we should, we should use a three-dimensional view. Um, Though, bear in mind, Constantine Doxiadis made an interesting comment in the 60s that though we think of cities as getting taller, if you plot their total area, the ratio of height to extent is actually going down. Our cities are not as tall as pre-modern cities used to be relative to their area of extent. We tend to forget there's this enormous skirt around our cities. So in, in, in a strange way, in average terms, our cities are flatter rather than taller, which is a bit disturbing. Oh, uh, sorry. I have a kind of consideration to say. Well, you were, plan you were presenting this industrialization model, but n up to now we know that there are many populations, many groups of people that are not living at all in an in industrialized kind of uh, behavior, and they have a different kind of relationship with their own environment. So the technology that they are actually using is very much balanced to work I mean, compared to the environment. So I think that something that has to be considered uh, is actually why technology or how technology or the evolution of technology is actually affecting or being affected by the kind of environment in which the different popula population are living. Um, it, it's a very fair question because clearly you can run sustainable landscape systems, and some societies do. Um, the broad concern at the moment is that we are not. The worry is that uh, it's a little risky to think purely in terms of technology. 
technology is one part of this whole assemblage of material behavior, which is all sorts of things. And the problem is that we're in a relationship with this material. We can't offload it. Two colleagues of mine have used the term entangled to describe the relationship between us and the material. We're not entangled, we're trapped. If we're entangled, like a ball of string, you could untangle it. We're not going to untangle ourselves from nuclear weaponry. We're not going to untangle ourselves from the urban world. And we have to work out how to play that game. But clearly, we have to bear in mind how we make things sustainable. You know, one of the things I've been very impressed by some of the cities I've been to is the number of green rooftops that you're beginning to see. Really elementary things like that, crucially important. So thank you for the question. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Okay. Question is on the theories of evolution. It's self-cultural evolution. Now, you have actually given us an insight into the way that cultural evolution has taken place. Yeah. But how can such a theory be used to actually look into the future? Because the reason being that technology really shapes today and in the future. And what is clear is that whatever technology we have today will be superseded by superior technology and it will keep on growing and it's exponential mm -hmm. and in given that kind of a growth and that kind of a change theories which have been developed on evolution evolution theory which was so gradual you're talking about you know million years mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of years yeah. and where change has been so slow and where we actually see the evolution but here, within a matter of, say, 50 years, or even 20 years, we see growth, which is changes which are so phenomenal. How can we use those theories that we have been developed based on the past in order to understand and project the future? Thank you. The, excuse me, the concern that I would have is if you look at the long time depth, our rates at the moment are part of a single trend. It isn't that nothing happened and now a lot happens. There have been cumulative increasing rapid, rapid changes. So for instance, um, stone tools, the early stone tools propagated very slowly around the world. Art propagated extremely fast. You find it at 40,000 years ago, almost everywhere, almost instantly. So, what is going on in our system is a relationship between our societies, our social operation, and materiality. And that relationship is accelerating. So for instance, when we had initial urban development, that went at a rate of five square K per century. In the Industrial Revolution, settlement acceleration went at 5,000 square K per century, a thousand times faster. So we're in a context where this acceleration is going on all the time. This is not exceptional. This is part of a trend. We're not doing something different from the past. The issue that is highly consequential about what you've described is that once you start using this model of material behavior being a precondition for big changes, the critical point it reveals is that technology as we now think of it is not what the future will consist of. Technology as we now think of it is the derivative of what was required to make the initial industrial transition. But hidden inside what we're now doing are a series of transformations which we may not recognize which will be the drivers of the future. Let me give you an example. The Industrial Revolution and urban management required clocks. But clocks had been developed in the 13th century, and the Swiss had developed the pocket watch, 
by the 16th century. But the watch, the clock, was originally developed to manage religious activity. And the small watches were developed because of a status obsession of the European elite. Those technologies of the clock were not developed with the Industrial Revolution in mind. So the terminology I would use now is there may be a material or a technology which we're using at the moment for colouring chewing gum. And it's actually the power source of the future. That's how disconcerting a situation we're in. There are things we're doing now, things we're playing with, which are the unanticipated technologies of those massive future changes. And you know all those wonderful images you see of future cities? They won't look like that at all. That's just us extrapolating our world into the future. They simply won't look like that at all. I'm afraid I have to disagree with you on that. In fact, uh, as somebody said, this is the big difference that we see, that in today's world, in today's world, the future is actually being invented. It might, but it might not be 100 percent. It would be maybe 80 percent, but that's what it is. And that's the major difference between what's happening today and in the past. That was evolutionary. We really can't see it. We won't be able to. But today, if you take all the big companies, they're actually creating the scenarios and looking at what the future will be like. And then they start building towards it because of commercial gain. And hence, Many of the things that were actually thought about say, 10 years ago have become reality. Indeed. And today they're doing the same thing. So uh, I have to slightly disagree with you on that. Oh, my, my point is even more radical than that, is that all that is going on, and that's an acceleration of something that's been happening for a long time. What is intriguing me is that the great changes which enabled these big transitions in the past were not developed for the purpose they ultimately serve. So thinking now with foresight, thinking ahead, but from where we are, is not actually getting us where that situation will be in the future. But, and this is the point to all innovators, look around, guys, look around, ladies and gentlemen, because somewhere in everything we're doing, are some very ordinary things which are the key to the future. And we cannot see them. We don't think they're what they will be. Nobody wanted a watch from Geneva in order to run factories in the 19th century. That's how different it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland.